White patches in a field are often referred to as alkali patches. The underlying problem might be high pH, alkalinity, but the salt in and of itself is not at a high pH and is therefore not alkaline. When you see salt on the surface, it's more properly called salinity. The reason for this is that alkalinity may or may not be there. If it's present, it may be near the surface or it may be deeper down. Compounding on this, alkalinity may not be present at all. Excess sodium cations, not excess sodium salts, could be the cause. Finally, just because you don't see salt on the surface doesn't mean salinity is not the problem. Regular soil testings helps to find these problem areas before they visibly manifest themselves. Huge amounts of money are spent trying to fix these patches with products or practices that either don't work or make it worse. Even if something is not trying to fix it, a person might be putting down fertilizer and seed every year with hope of getting something, only to be disappointed at harvest time. Now digging deeper, literally in this case, and doing the proper tests will help you to diagnose and decide. In this episode, I'll give an overview of how I approach this and why it's critical that you get solid advice from a certified crop advisor, also known as a CCA, or a professional agrologist, which is a PAG designation. So welcome to the sixth season of Plants Dig Soil, a podcast about realistic regen ag. I'm your host, Scott Gillespie. I'm an author and independent agronomist from the Western Canadian Prairies, specializing in climate smart agriculture. I focus on scientifically proven practices to benefit the planet and just as importantly, farmers economic sustainability. So be sure to visit my website, www.plantstigsoil.com to learn about my book, Practical Regeneration, and for the services that I offer for farmers and agribusiness. So let's start with salinity. When we see salts on the surface, this is because they were once dissolved in water. Now, once the water's gone, all that remains are the salts. Now, saline patches will always be in the lowest part of the landscape or where water gets pushed back up to the surface through underground flows. In periods of high rainfall, the water table moves higher, and you may see water in these areas for extended periods. Since it has nowhere to go, it slowly evaporates off. Any salts that were dissolved in it end up sticking around. Now, under regular rainfall, the salts will keep getting washed down. However, if they can't get deep in the soil, they'll get stuck a few feet or a few meters down. This will impede plant growth because the salts prevent the roots from taking up water. Now, when it's a few feet down, it will affect plant growth later in the season because they can't rely on the deep water. And since they don't use the salty water, it's more likely water will accumulate here in the off season which raises the water table, dissolving salts, and then depositing them when it evaporates. Now, there are no magic cures for salinity. The only way to get rid of excess salts is to lower the water table and flush them down. If you can get them deeper than the root zone, they'll be fine as long as you can keep the water table low. Where trees naturally grow, they can be used to draw down the water and keep it from recharging. In my area of the prairies, trees do not grow well, so perennial forages or native grasses with deep roots are the best tool for lowering the water table. These species don't have to be salt tolerant. They can work from the nearby recharge area and help prevent the water from moving underground to the discharge area, which is the saline area. Now, this is a fix that takes many years or even decades to work. Salt tolerant species like AC Saltlander can help the change happen faster by starting closer to or right inside the most saline areas. Now, tile drainage can be used instead of or in conjunction with the use of plants. This can work if you have a place for the water to go and you're permitted to put the water there. Since saline areas are usually at the lowest point of the landscape, this makes it challenging to find a place to put the water. So please check local regulations first. You cannot just start draining water without permission. You would not want an upslope neighbor improving their land, but then helping water bypass onto yours. So show the same respect for those downslope from you. 
In the past, clay tiles were used. These were small sections of pipe that were laid underground. The water seeped in between the sections and then would get channeled away. Growing up on a farm in Ontario, I recall having to do some work with my dad and brothers on old clay tiles. They were installed early in the last century, and while many still worked, some got clogged with sand and then made underground springs in the middle of fields. Now, whether you use clay or plastic, the pipe must decline towards the place that the water can drain into. And usually multiple runs of pipe would run into a header pipe that directs all the water to the drainage area. A tile can work faster than plants, but it still takes a few years from installation for the salts to fully flush out with repeated rain or irrigation events. Once flushed out, the tiles continue to keep the water table below the rooting zone. Combining plants and pipe can expedite the process. The plants pump the excess water out of the recharge area, and the pipes flush the salts away and keep the water table low in the lower area. Now, the place where this may not work is if you're dealing with sodic soils. These are soils that are so tight that water does not flow the, through them well. A tile could be installed, but the water will still be impeded from flowing. This is because sodic soil has no structure. It's a soil with too many sodium cations. This is not sodium salt. This is sodium that causes clay and organic matter to collapse, which seals the soil from water flow. A tougher beast is solanetic soil. This is a soil that has a saline layer over a sodic layer. This is incorrectly referred to as an alkali patch in the common usage of the term. So what is an alkali patch? An alkali patch in the technical definition is just a soil with high pH. In fact, these are very likely solanetic soils. These are sodic soils that are below the surface that impede the water due to high sodium cations, causing salts, which are usually made up of sodium salt, to accumulate on the surface when the water evaporates. Now, sodium salts affect the plant by not allowing them to take up water. Sodium cations affect water by not allowing it to move through the soil. So this is where an agronomist who understands this is critical. Too many times I see people applying products or amendments that are not going to help. In some cases, they may temporarily re relieve symptoms and they appear to work but if the underlying issue is not dealt with, the money is wasted. Of course, it may not be wasted entirely because the person that sold the product still makes their money. In other cases, what is added may make the problem worse. When you have a soil like this, the key is soil testing. You need to get samples from different layers and you need to compare the problem area to a good area. They must be sent to a lab that can test for the sodium adsorption ratio, or SAR. It also can be called the exchangeable sodium percentage, which is ESP. An electrical conductivity, which is EC, test tells us the salt levels, and a test of free lime and pH tells us the level of alkalinity. With these numbers, a proper diagnosis can be completed. Now, while some labs complete a base saturation ratio, or BSR, this is unnecessary. There's a direct correlation between the base saturation ratio and pH, and we already have pH. Now, base saturation ratios are a poor predictor of the underlying sodium problem. The SAR, sodium adsorption ratio, correctly puts the number to the severity of the problem and helps guide the type and quantity of amendment needed. Now, if free lime is present, which is high pH or alkalinity, then an acidic amendment, such as elemental sulfur, which is low pH, will often be the solution. It frees up the calcium to displace the sodium. If free lime is not present, then gypsum is usually needed to add calcium to displace the sodium. In both cases, adding elemental sulfur or adding gypsum, you still need to flush the sodium out with water. And again, this takes many years to do, and it needs a place to go. So if you can only affect the surface layer, but the underlying area is still tight, you haven't really achieved anything. When the layers are shallow and the salinity or sodacity, or both, 
is not severe, there are options such as manure, compost, deep ripping, and deep plowing. If this allows the plants to establish, it can be worth it. In the case of organic amendments, they can help in the short term, but in time, as the organic matter decays, the soil can seal up again. Before trying this, be sure to get a soil test. This only works if you can affect the layer that's causing the problem, and it only works in mild cases of salinity or sodacity. I think the draw of deep tillage is to be able to use a very powerful tractor with a large plow and get in there and try to fix things. I've seen some of these on YouTube. They go up to a meter deep and are often just one blade. Sometimes they have two large tractors pulling a single blade. However, mixing saline soil with sodic soil is unlikely to create a good agricultural soil. It'll only work if the upper layer has the calcium to react with the sodium once they're together. And again, before doing this, please get a soil test. You may have fun doing it, but if you're not going to improve crop growth, what's the point? And a final very important note, if you do decide to do this, call before you dig. Underground pipelines and utilities are often shallower than these plows go. There are links to the four key resources I used in creating this episode. One is called Solonetsic Soils, More Compact, More Complex, and it's from Top Crop Manager. Management of Sodic Soils in Alberta is a fact sheet from Alberta Agriculture that goes more in depth with some solutions that I have mentioned. Chapter 5 called Soil Chemistry from a book Digging into Canadian Soils and Introduction to Soil Science gets very technical, but it's a great resource for those that really want to understand the issue. Now, finally, there's an article called Base Saturation and Cation Exchange Capacity, and that's a resource that goes into the history and the science behind base saturation ratios. If you believe they work, then I'm sure this will not sway you. But for everyone else, this helps to explain how a good idea with initial promise did not stand the test of time. All are free to download. Again, I'll put the links in the episode description. And one final note, if you're dealing with these type of soils, be sure to get a hold of me. I do charge money to help you diagnose and decide on what to do with these type of soils. But charging for my advice is how I make a living and how it helps me to put out these free podcast episodes. So I hope this helps and I'll talk to you again next time.